If you're not already subscribed to this YouTube channel, go ahead and hit the subscribe button now, along with the bell icon so you can be notified whenever a new video is posted. And if you're already subscribed, check and make sure that YouTube hasn't unsubscribed you. And of course, be sure to give the video a like, as well as share it on your social media. The white supremacists hate that. Now, that said, we spend a lot of time concentrating on the domestic wing of the enforcement arm of white supremacy, but we need to make sure that we devote attention, especially as white supremacy comes under increasing pressure internally, to focus on the foreign or rather international wing of white supremacy's enforcement arm, and that is the U.S. military. But then again, as you no doubt have noticed, there's an enormous amount of overlap between the two, always has been. And this overlapping has become incestuous in recent years. It's had to. The militarization of the police it has not been the result of police departments who have just gotten up one morning and decided we need military equipment. It's the U.S. government letting them know, hey, guys, we're helping you out here. This is the direction that we want you to go in. The U.S. government offers these police departments money if they militarize. This wasn't something that the police departments themselves came up with alone. Sure, they were a large part of it. They wanted it. But let's not pretend as if, oh, well, the government were just unwitting allies in this. These bastards work hand in hand. There is an internal culture of anti-black racism in the U.S. military. Always has been. And we need to make sure that we understand that there's a reason why you got so many of these white supremacists saying, like Donald Trump and others saying, we should send in the U.S. military into some of these black cities. We ought to send the U.S. military in. Sure, we don't send them in whenever there's white folks who are cutting up. But black folks, if it seems like black people are going to start agitating in the streets for what's theirs, we need to send in the military. Well, they're not doing it to do black people any favors. Remember. During the Tulsa Race Massacre, you had the U.S. military who came in to help the white marauders, to back them up. That's what they were there for. They were killing the black people in their own town. That's what the U.S. military did when they showed up a hundred years ago. When they talk about against all enemies, foreign and domestic, yeah, against any black people domestically and against any black people internationally. That's the U.S. military. A lot of them in the U.S. military see that as their real mission. And then you wonder why it is that a lot of these guys, when they cycle out of the military, they immediately start telling the police chiefs and the sheriffs, you know, I should be able to carry my assault rifle with me. And they're like, good. Oh, we like that idea. Please do not think that what you see from these police departments is somehow isolated from or otherwise apart from what is going on in the U.S. military. You take a look at that bastard Jonathan Pentland who attacked a black neighbor who was doing nothing more vicious than walking down the street. That little bald head bastard, he got people pulled up on him. And he ran like the punk that he is. All of a sudden, Mr. We know who our neighbors are and you better. All of a sudden, he was running like a scared little sissy punk. These bastards ain't got no heart. But you know who else doesn't have any heart? The U.S. military, particularly the Secretary of Defense. There's no talk about what punishment's going to be levied against this white supremacist thug. And you know what the reason for that is? It's because there's been a long-standing tradition in the U.S. military that when it comes to white supremacist violence, they do not merely decide that they're going to get, cluck their teeth and go, oh, that's too bad. They don't do a damn thing about it. Because the U.S. military is aiding and abetting them. This is not a matter of they don't know. It's a matter of this is the policy of the U.S. military. The individuals who run the U.S. military and who set policy for it and who are supposed to carry out its policies, all of, all of them, Caucasian, by the way, they also have a policy that when it comes to white supremacy, doesn't matter if it's your online with a message board that you're trying to use in order to promote white supremacy or if you're carrying out violent white supremacist acts against other members of the military. We're not doing anything about it. USA Today ran a story last month about 13 incidents. Those are just the 13 incidents that they chose to look at. And there were no court martials in any of them. These were violent incidents, by the way. 
violent incidents, stuff that's supposed to put you in Fort Leavenworth for some serious time. Instead, the U.S. military didn't do a damn thing about it. Just like with the Catholic Church, or just like with white supremacists in the classrooms or the police departments, it's a matter of we're not doing anything about it. Well, this person committed an act of violence, so you can't give them an honorable discharge, so they created a new category, less than honorable discharge. Yeah, we can't say that he was discharged honorably, but we're not going to say it's dishonorable because that would mean that they don't get any of their benefits. So we want to make sure that they'll be able to get money from Uncle Sam and they'll be able to get their nasty mangled little teeth taken care of or what have you. So we're going to give them less than honorable discharge so they can maintain all their benefits. We got to look out for, you know, white supremacists have to look out for one another, don't you know? These are the bastards who run the U.S. military. This is what's going on. This is no accident. This is not some sort of happenstance. This is standard operating procedure. So if you're wondering what are the chances that this skinhead, Pentland, is going to be punished, well, the U.S. military is already making it clear the fix is in. We protect white supremacists in the service, don't you know? So it's no surprise that you saw what you saw on January 6th. The so-called Oath Keepers, who are comprised of former police and military, the domestic and international wings of the Enforcement Armor White Supremacy. That's what they're... We are the official club for the Enforcement Armor White Supremacy. And those bastards, they led the charge to storm the Capitol. And you know who else was there? One Colonel Brock of the U.S. Air Force retired... He was the scumbag who you saw wearing his little tank driver hat or whatever the hell you want to call that cap that he had on. Had some plastic zip ties with him. But I'm sure that he was looking for some garbage bags that he could tie off. He certainly wasn't there to use them against it. He just had them in hand at the moment, don't you know? Because I'm sure that he just found them lying around somewhere and decided to run around with them. But did you know that he can't be court-martialed because he's no longer active duty? And without a court-martial, he can't be stripped of his retirement pay or benefits. But then again, as we've already seen, as I just got through pointing out to you, even with a court-martial, even with some sort of investigation, the U.S. military would just say, okay, well, he's already retired, so we're just going to say that there's nothing at all that we can do about this guy. Or even if he wasn't retired, even if he was, uh, even if he was reserve, they would just be saying something else. This is a former colonel who took part in this treason. A former colonel, and for those of you who are not familiar with the rank structure of the military, a colonel is one step below a general. Yeah, he may have been a lieutenant colonel, but the point is he still got the bird on his shoulders. He still got the insignia, so let's not sit here and, and try to mince words or, or split hairs. Dude's only one step below being a general, and this is what the hell he pulls. Why is it that this bastard thought that he could do something like this? Even though it's well known that the U.S. military wouldn't punish him, nonetheless, he seemed to think that he was not merely acting on his own. I ain't just talking about a couple of inbred hayseeds playing dress-up like the Oath Keepers. That Lieutenant Colonel Brock, he seemed to think that he was acting on behalf of other senior military leaders. That's what he seemed to think. Oh, we'll get to that in a moment. But we would be remiss if we didn't mention Ashley Babbitt, also of the Air Force. Well, she's now the late Ashley Babbitt. She committed treason and she wound up dying for betraying her country. She was a bad seed, by the way, from the jump. Been one for a long time. You see, the white media doesn't tell you who and what Ashley Babbitt was, but the woman's got a rap sheet. You won't be surprised to know that. January 6th was not her first time breaking the law. It wasn't the first time by a long shot. In 2016, Ashley Babbitt, who the white media, especially the white right media, tries to paint as being some sort of misguided woman who was, oh, her business was had fallen on hard times. Ain't that the bullcrap that Bill Maher was trying to say about her? 
trying to get some phony sympathy for it. Oh, she had her business was in trouble, and that's the reason why she was at the Capitol. Well, let me go ahead and tell you some of Ashley Babbitt's rap sheet, and you tell me if it seems like that January 6th insurrection stunt of hers was just a fluke. In 2016, she had been charged with reckless endangerment, malicious destruction of property, and tampering with a car. Reports are that Babbitt had gone after her first husband's ex-girlfriend with her SUV. So, apparently Babbitt saw her husband's ex-girlfriend, flew into a jealous rage, got in her SUV and chased the woman down the highway and rear-ended her car a few times. That's where the charges of reckless endangerment, malicious destruction of property, and tampering with a car came from. But, of course, Ashley Babbitt's not black, so she beat the rap on that one. Court records showed that she had not one but two restraining orders against her, as obviously it was her husband's ex who had filed these restraining orders. And you won't be surprised to learn that Ashley Babbitt's second and final husband, who she was married to at the time she committed treason, was himself in the Marine Corps. Now, there's no word on whether or not Babbitt's widower husband was himself a member of the Oath Keepers or some other white supremacist group, though he has filed a nuisance suit against the Capitol Hill police for $10 million. Oh, by the way, Babbitt had a tweet on Twitter that she posted saying, I'll be rolling through your hood with my red hat. Rolling through your hood... Yeah, you know, a number of those white supremacists who like to fancy themselves as being soldiers. That's one of them little threats they like to make against black folks. D.C. is a majority black city, by the way. Well, the only rolling that Ashley Babbitt's going to be doing now is in her grave. But the point is, this is who Ashley Babbitt was. This is who people like Bill Maher try to get phony sympathy for and tell you that she was just a business owner at the end of her rope because of hard business economic times due to to the 2020 lockdowns and quarantines. And, and, oh yeah, she was just a victim of circumstance. Was she a victim of circumstance in 2016? Was she a victim of circumstance that time too? Was it the 2020 quarantine that made her take her SUV and smash it into some innocent woman's car in 2016? Was that the reason why that happened too? See the bullcrap contortions you gotta go through when you're an undercover white supremacist like Bill Maher. At this point, he's barely undercover. He's basically all but declared at this point. But this is what you have to do to try to cover for these white supremacist thugs in the military. This is the contortions you gotta go through. To try to make it seem like somehow they're the victims. There's a lot of things that you can call Ashley Babbitt treasonous, a disgrace to the uniform, an insurrectionist. But the one thing that nobody can call Ashley Babbitt truthfully is a victim. But it gets better than that. Not only do you have the sawed-off former potato peelers who go calling themselves joining the Oath Keepers. Not only do you have retirees and these half-cocked idiots like Ashley Babbitt running around, but you also have special forces who happen to be a bunch of card-carrying white supremacists as well. It was covered for about one day and then immediately done away with that in secret Facebook groups, America's best white warriors share racist jabs, lies about 2020, even QAnon theories. So yeah, these are America's special forces. Supposed to be America's elite. Yeah, elite white supremacists as they see themselves. And then you wonder why it is that you got all of these white militia groups who are running around with the kind of tactics that they don't normally teach in the normal service. Yeah, because you got these white supremacists and special forces, many of them who call themselves being part of these groups. And of course, they had some choice words about current Secretary of Defense Austin. You can imagine just the usual, well, he's only got the job because he's black, I don't have any respect for him, etc., etc. This is America's Special Forces. You notice how, how this has progressed here, and I set it up this way for a reason. You start off with one white supremacist skinhead from the army, then you got a gang of these 
scumbags who go and storm the Capitol, but they were retired or otherwise not in the service. Then we show you guys who are not just in the service, but these are supposed to be America's special forces. Supposed to be the best of the best that America produces, as far as military skill goes. Though, truth be told, when you read up on some of the misadventures that especially the Navy SEALs have had, these guys come off as more like the Keystone Cops in camouflage. That's when you read about the, the, it's just a comedy of errors, a lot of the stuff that these morons wind up getting into. A lot of their stories just read like the stuff of a late night comedian skit. But this is what America's elite soldiers do when they're online, sounding no different than any other white supremacist that you would find on Stormfront or on the Daily Wire or anywhere else. But you know, up until this point, basically that Lieutenant Colonel Brock character, he's about the highest ranking that you get that anyone's found when it comes to these white supremacist scumbags in the military. So you got one outlier who happens to be higher rank, but mostly what you got are people like just a bunch of half-cocked misfits, oddballs, and screw-ups like Ashley Babbitt and the Oath Keeper clowns and some grunts and special forces, knuckle-dragging, hairy-kneed morons, mouth-breathing idiots. But nobody who is actually senior staff flag rank or anything like that. I mean, it's not like there's any generals or admirals who happen to be part of this kind of white supremacist nonsense. Oh, wait. Because this is a story that most of you haven't heard about. The white media has done everything they can to bury it. The agenda-setting media, the ABCs, the Washington Post, the New York Times, they've decided that apparently this is so disturbing they don't even want to report on it. But Politico reported on how there was a letter put out by 124 retired generals and admirals who were helping to repeat and spread the lie that Joe Biden had stolen the election. And that apparently something needs to be done about the political correctness in the military. But it's not until you actually look at the letter itself, this open letter from these guys calling themselves flag officers for America. I guess the for stands for Fourth Reich. It's not until you actually look at the letter that you see that this is not at all some document having to do with we're concerned about the integrity and discipline of the military. Instead, it's nothing more than a bunch of white supremacists who made it to general and admiral's ranks who are putting into who are putting on paper their white supremacist dogma. But when you look at their letter that they wrote, it's a white supremacist screed is what it is. The first thing that they start off with is that they're protesting the fact that the National Guard happens to be deployed in the Capitol. Uh, Yeah, because apparently they didn't notice the January 6th insurrection. So what they're saying is guarding against a non-existent threat. So they're telling you what they think about the January 6th insurrection. Only thing they didn't say was why those white supremacists, if you didn't know better, you would have thought that they were just tourists who were roaming around the Capitol Rotunda if you didn't know any better. That's the only thing that they didn't say. A non-existent threat. Yeah, sure, hundreds of white supremacists who stormed the Capitol building, who urinate and defecate in the hallways, who are screaming, hang Mike Pence who are pushing their way, beating the hell out of the Capitol Hill police, barging their way into the U.S. Senate chamber. These guys are a non-existent threat, and 124 admirals and generals combined signed their name to that lie. That tells you that there are senior military people who look at the January 6th insurrection as being an act that was being carried out with their approbation and with their support. But next, these guys sign that... Among, as well as just deploying the U.S. military against a non-existent threat, they also object to forcing politically correct policies like the divisive critical race theory into the military. Now, uh, are these supposed to be admirals and generals or a bunch of pundits on Fox News? I can't tell. Look at what they point out here. 
We object to divisive critical race theory. Critical race theory mostly has to do with teaching history, particularly slavery. And these guys say that that's divisive. Yeah, teaching history is divisive, don't you know? These are senior admirals and generals who just a few years ago, in many of their cases, happened to be in the halls of the Pentagon. And now look what it is that they're saying. Now that they're out of the service and they feel like we can't be court-martialed for what we're doing, now they're saying what they really think. And what they think is, white is right. And white must always have its guaranteed place as number one. And anything that even remotely criticizes or critiques or examines the position of the dominant society in this country, why, that is a threat. And we are against the teaching of history in the U.S. military. But, of course, these guys, since they're just a pack of white supremacists with a few medals and ribbons on them, they made it very clear that it's not just the military who they are hoping to purge of any and all challenges to white supremacy. They then go on to talk about the police. Quote, the rule of law, why don't they just say law and order, is fundamental to our republic and security. Anarchy as seen in certain cities cannot be tolerated. Anarchy? So the white supremacists with badges who are destroying the cities, they're not the threat. The anarchy is the uprisings by the citizens who are fighting back. That's the threat. But understand, when you got people who are running around saying things like, well, the U.S. military ought to be deployed in certain cities, yeah, I'm sure that these 124 white supremacist thugs who signed this letter, that's exactly what they would like to see. Oh, they would love to have the opportunity to be able to put people like the special forces white supremacist trash that I just told you about, or to put the Ashley Babbitts and the Lieutenant Colonel Brocks, and to put the Jonathan Pentlands. Oh, I'm sure he'd love to do foot patrol in a black area. I'm sure that he would love that if he could have an assault rifle and apparently the ability to go ahead and kill some black people under the guise of why we're just backing up law enforcement, don't you know? We're here for public safety, don't you know? They're sitting here saying that they oppose to call it whatever you want, whether it be uprisings by citizens who are defending themselves and their right to live, or the opportunity to deploy their white supremacist foot soldiers under the guise of public safety. Look what they're saying. Anarchy cannot be tolerated. The only anarchy is coming from the thugs with badges. But to continue, they write, we must support our law enforcement personnel. Uh, aren't these guys supposed to be concerned only with military affairs? After all, in their previous little whining screed, they had said that they were concerned about America's readiness to fight and win our nation's wars. We must support our military and vets. Focus on war fighting. Eliminate the political correctness which damages morale and war fighting cohesion. So they say, fight and win our nation's wars, focus on war fighting, morale and war fighting cohesion. That's three times that they say war fighting, war fighting, war fighting. Yeah, except it seems pretty obvious the war that these admirals and generals want to focus on fighting is a race war. Because when they sit there and transition from that immediately to, we must support our law enforcement personnel, what the hell do the thugs with badges have to do with fighting a nation's wars, war fighting, war fighting cohesion? What the hell does that have to do with fighting wars? War is supposed to be taking, the military is supposed to be fighting overseas. Isn't that supposed to be their focus? Why should they even be talking about the police? The police should be irrelevant for these idiots. But instead, you see, that's front of mind for them. We must support our law enforcement personnel. That's right, because the foreign wing of the white supremacist enforcement arm has to also look out for the domestic wing. That's them showing professional courtesy for their two halves and letting you know that they are both flip sides of the same coin. 
Then they go on to say, we must insist that DAs, our courts, and the Department of Justice enforce the law equally, fairly, and consistently toward all. Now, the fact that they say that right after saying we must support our law enforcement personnel, and then they immediately shift to insist that DA's courts and the DOJ enforce the law equally. In other words, hands off the thugs in blue. That's what that means. All of this DAs who are prosecuting the police and the courts who are refusing to throw these verdicts out and the DOJ who is bringing these admittedly token just for show civil rights accusations and charges, just a few of them, just for show. That's what they're talking about. We have to insist that there be a hands-off policy for the thugs in blue, because a lot of them happen to be our former military foot soldiers who we sent to go fight our race war. I mean, uh, win our nation's wars. There you go. 124 former generals and admirals signed this letter. They wrote this letter. And what they tell you is, as they see it, the U.S. military's mission is to fight a race war. When they talk about winning our nation's wars, that means the nation's wars against black people. We must support law enforcement and insist that the DAs and the courts and the Department of Justice not run around holding the thugs with badges accountable. See, they don't like the fact that for the first time, at least in a minor sense, on a very low level, the law is finally being enforced equally, fairly, and consistently toward the thugs in blue. But that's the problem. It's being enforced. At no point do they say anything about white supremacists in the military. At no point do they say that the police have destroyed the very concept of due process, the willingness of the people to even wait and see if the courts or the judicial apparatuses are actually going to work. If you have the individuals who are supposed to be enforcing the law or upholding the law, who are running around breaking the law and telling everybody, thumbing their noses at the public and telling everybody, nothing's going to be done against us. We can break the, the law any way we want. Well, hell, the public's going to look and go, well, hell, everybody can play that game then. You're not the only ones who can do that. We can all do that then. That's who's destroyed the rule of law. This country's never had the rule of law. Was it John Adams or whomever who said, are we a country of laws or a country of men? Well, the white supremacists answered that one with Thomas Jefferson. It's a nation of men, white men. Damn sure ain't a nation of laws. White supremacy and those classified as white are immune from punishment. That is the totality of the law, and that's what they're trying to uphold and protect and preserve. But I just want to make sure that you saw that from the very beginning, whether it be some retired pinheads, whether it be some special forces grunts, whether it be some mouth breathing morons in the Proud Boys, whether it be senior generals and admirals who were the ones who were carrying out the military operations and setting policy for the military, they are all on the same page. You need to understand it ain't just the thugs in blue that we're dealing with here. Because a large part of the white media's job is to try to sanctify the institutions of white supremacy. To try to give some thin patina of morality and ethics to what are just a bunch of lawless, completely principled less, if I may coin a term, barbarians and marauders. There is no law to them. They made it a point that they were going to link the two ideas of critical race theory with we're going to support law enforcement and insist that the DAs and the courts and the DOJ have a hands-off approach to the thugs in blue. Enforce the law equally, fairly, and consistently. What that means is, if that's the case then, why the hell are they even bothered? Yeah, the message they're sending is you're being too tough on the thugs with badges. You guys are being too tough on them. You shouldn't be doing anything to them at all. You need to enforce the law equally and fairly, and that means you don't do anything about the thugs in blue. Because after all, it could become habit-forming to start punishing white supremacists. That, we don't want that to become habit-forming. 
They understand that if the power of the people can touch the domestic wing of the enforcement arm of white supremacy, then the power of the people can also touch the foreign wing of it as well. Oh, that's what they saw with that Pentland skinhead. Oh, he's in the army. Yeah. And the public turned up at his house. The public came to where he sleeps. They came to where he lives and he had to flee. Oh, yeah, the people came, the citizens came and overran that little white supremacist position. They overran his position and ran him straight out of town. He was going, retreat, retreat. Yeah. And those special forces punks on Facebook, America's elite warriors. Yeah, elite keyboard warriors. They're a bunch of elite keyboard commandos. Yeah, they're real tough from behind the anonymity of a computer screen or behind the anonymity and security of a military apparatus that will not punish them because, as we've seen, the senior military officials in the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines are a bunch of card-carrying white supremacists. The generals and admirals who are supposed to be running the military are themselves a bunch of anti-black racists. And I saved the third point for last. It came before the other two, but I wanted you to I wanted to save it for last because this is what they started off with, saying that the free flow of information is critical to the security of our republic. Really, in that case, then I wonder how many Freedom of Information Act requests that these guys blocked or turned down or denied when they were in the military. Since we're talking about the free flow of information, I'm sure the Freedom of Information Act is precious to these guys, right? Hey, how many white supremacists have they refused to punish? By the way, they keep that real close to the vest. Oh, no. How many white supremacists have we incident attacks and incidents we had in the military? Well, we can't tell you that because, you know, we're all about the free flow of information, don't you know? Except where white supremacists are concerned. But they go on to talk about censoring speech and expression, that all of this, that that's a bad thing. When they say censoring speech and expression, that's the same garbage you get from these white supremacists that you see in social media. That means the white supremacists are free to spread their anti-black vitriol and that platforms just better not do anything or say anything about it. They have the right to try to bums rush anybody's website and turn that into a free fire zone for their anti-black vitriol. That's what it means. Because you don't see them standing for anything that would benefit anyone who's not white. Hell, that sounds like it came from people like BS. I mean, uh, Ben Shapiro. I wonder if he's the one who scribbled this nonsense. Then they say we must counter this on all fronts, beginning with removing Section 230 protection from big tech. That doesn't sound like a military objective at all. It has absolutely nothing to do with fighting a war. That has nothing to do with fighting China or fighting Russia or fighting Al Qaeda or anybody else. That is a strictly and strictly political agenda there, particularly a racial one. Because when they talk about censoring free speech, censoring speech and expression, they make sure not to say, oh, we're talking about all these white supremacists here. They're very careful to be circuitous with their language. They're being deliberately oblique and vague. But everybody knows what they're talking about. These are Fox News talking points. These are the kind of bullcrap talking points that people like BS, I mean, uh, Ben Shapiro talk about. So it's like Grover Norquist said, you don't have to spell it out. They know what you're talking about. You don't have to spell it out. They already know and they're already on board. So they're all for the free flow of information. Unless that information has to do with slavery and white supremacy, then as far as they're concerned, we need to keep divisive policies like this out of the military. Yeah, let's keep the divisive teaching of accurate history out of the military, but as for white supremacist hate speech, why, we need to protect that. We need to go to the mat for that one. Oh, and by the way, lest I forget, they didn't just do this merely as them slamming their gums, just a wish list of things that they wish that the government would do or some policies that they wish would be enacted upon the nation. Some of the senior military white supremacists who signed this letter, they're running for political office. That's right, the bastards who signed this letter, they're doing this as basically their policy platform. These are the planks of their white supremacist political platform that they're putting out here. 
These are their campaign promises. Retired Army Brigadier General Don Boldu is running for the U.S. Senate in New Hampshire. And another one of these clowns, who apparently has some anti-Muslim views, this guy is apparently mobbed up with the Family Research Council, one of those white supremacist think tanks, one of those white supremacist public policy institutes. So understand, these guys are not just saying this as some sort of idle chatter. This is not just idle rhetoric. What they're making very clear is that now that they are no longer bound by the Uniform Code of Military Justice, now that they no longer have to worry about having their benefits stripped from them because they're no longer in the military. They're retired now. So don't have to worry about being court-martialed for this crap. So that being the case, now it's time to begin a new war. The war that they really wanted to fight. You got senior admirals and generals who are telling you in no uncertain terms that the enemy is not and has never been communism. The enemy is not and has never been the Russians. The enemy is not and has never been Al-Qaeda. The enemy is not and has never been China. The enemy is and has always been black people. Now you see, this is what the white supremacists do when they come out of the military. They make sure that they're trying to arm the white supremacists, make sure the white supremacists are turned into at least a halfway capable militia to fight this race war that they intend to wage. And where are the black soldiers at? Former, active duty, or any other capacity at? Where are the general honorees to speak about this? Where are the Colin Powells at? Where any of these black folks, any of these black men in particular, who are supposed to be proud career soldiers of the United States, they get real quiet and real scarce at times like this. But I'm also looking at the black men who happen to have been in the military. You see what your former white com comrades have done with their military training. They're taking their military training and taking it to police departments so that they can more so that they can more effectively kill black people. They're taking it to these white supremacist militias like the Oath Keepers so that they can teach them, hopefully, how to at least kill somebody or kill something. Why is it that we do not have more, if any, black soldiers who are doing the work of making sure that black people understand gun safety? And most importantly, gun control, which means controlling what you aim at. Making sure that they are passing on what they've learned. Making sure that they are giving the people the information. Making sure that people understand that if any of these former admirals and generals, if they've got any protégés, you know, like Lieutenant Colonel Brock... Or if the Jonathan Pentlands, the other Jonathan Pentlands who haven't been caught out yet... If all of these sawed-off white supremacists who have just been engaging in acts of violence with impunity, if they finally get their wish that they've been agitating for, and they finally get to bring in just the plain old U.S. military, not just military equipment in the hands of some chow-dipping, snuff snorting white supremacist in some police or sheriff's department, but if you get the actual legitimate military who finally gets to deploy in a city, a black city, because they ain't going to the white ones, if they finally get their wish, who's going to make sure that the black citizens have the wherewithal to make sure that they are not threatened by any white supremacist in military uniform or without that black people have the wherewithal to ensure their safety against all white supremacists, foreign as well as domestic. Don't you let that white media tell you any garbage lies. They sit there trying to, to otherwise valorize and sanitize the institutions of white supremacy to the point that people think of it as a truism that the U.S. military has an internal culture that makes it where they would not stage a coup. Because part of their little letter was that they think that Joe Biden's senile or off his rocker or they're questioning his mental fitness. And while a good part of that happens to be some white supremacists who are no doubt venting their ire, a large part of it happens to be what they're listing here, this garbage about we, as far as we're concerned, we're going to, we would like to get rid of critical race theory 
and we see the that all these uprisings against the killings of black people with impunity, this is anarchy and cannot be tolerated. What do you think would happen if you gave these bastards the ability to go ahead and put their little words into action? What do you think you would have? Do you think that these bastards who signed and wrote this letter, that they would turn down the opportunity for a coup d'etat? Or do you think they'd be looking and going, you know what? It's an idea whose time has come. Because every military coup starts off with the rationale, with the narrative that the situation is so bad, so intolerable, why a military dictatorship would be preferable to the anarchy and to the lawlessness and to the threats that are going unchecked. You better understand that there's a number of individuals in the U.S. military who have been floating trial balloons for a coup d'etat. And what kind of military dictatorship with, the, with these good old boys, these scumbags, what kind of military rule would they put in place? Well, for starters, it would be one where black people would be killed with impunity and they would be signing off on all of it, just like they do in the military. Oh, yeah, you think that just about a dozen cases of white supremacist violence and lawlessness that they don't punish, that you think that's just some one off or just a series of coincidences, that would be standard operating procedure. They're making it very clear precisely what kind of military dictatorship they would like to see in the United States. You better understand that whenever you have right wing hate radio or Fox News or whatever who talk about Chicago's completely lawless and out of control, they're trying to create a rationale for what they want to do because they know the first time that somebody signs off on send in the U.S. military, the brakes are going to be off. That's going to throw the floodgates open. What you think is going to be just in Chicago? These bastards did not say Chicago. They said seen in certain cities, plural. They didn't say Chicago. As far as they're concerned, they got a list of cities that they intend to place under direct white supremacist military control. That's what this is supposed to lay the groundwork for. Before you can pull a stunt like this, before you can pull some audacious, mind-blowing bit of treason and such, first you got to prepare the minds of the public for what it is you intend to do. So you start the steady drumbeat. You want to normalize the idea that whatever it is that we're about to do, whatever foul, wild, out-of-control stunt we're about to pull, why, it's nothing compared to what's going on right now. That's the narrative that you have to start beating the drum for first. You have to normalize that kind of talk. But you've also had a number of individuals in other cities, not just Chicago, but a number of other individuals in other cities in the last year alone who have been saying, well, you know what? Oh, there's been some killings and game bangers fighting over drug turf. Man, we, even though, keep in mind, the murder rate and such are actually at historic lows. You wouldn't know that from the white media, the way they tell the story. But it's actually at the lowest point in decades. And yet they're sitting here talking as if there are folks being killed by the hundreds every single day in every single city, and that ain't the case. What they're really trying to do is to create a narrative that won't be questioned, because when it comes time to talk about sending in the military into black areas... The individuals who sign off on it, they're not actually going to do the math and ask, wait a minute, is this really the worst that it's ever been? Or even ask if it's as bad as it's ever been or even bad at all. They're just going to be saying, well, uh, somebody in the, the, the media is saying that there's absolute anarchy and lawlessness. And uh, I, I think that we should do something. I have to be seen as doing something. It's not about what is real. Under white supremacy, white supremacy is all about dictating to you what reality is. The same people who told you that black folks didn't have a problem with Mike Bloomberg's stop and frisk policies, these are the same people who are trying to get you to have the idea that Lieutenant Colonel Brock and Jonathan Pentland ought to be deployed in a black neighborhood near you. Uh, yeah, because we've seen how Jonathan Pentland handles his neighborhood watch. He doesn't believe in harassing people for no damn reason. He just believes in going after criminals, don't you know? So family, understand what the hell it is that they're hoping to lay the groundwork for. And all the black folks who are in the military, you're not supposed to be sitting idle with the skills that you've learned. 
The white supremacists don't believe that their skills were simply meant to be fighting against Al-Qaeda and such. And if these bastards get the idea that they're going to start some sort of war against us here, which they've been prosecuting and fighting, by the way, they don't just have the idea of it. What they want to do is to intensify it and make it official. So that being the case, you got a lot of black folks who happen to know exactly what the tactics are that these guys would try to use. What little stunts they might think that they want to pull. The antidote to white supremacists in the U.S. military are black empowerment specialists in the military. Black empowerment specialists who make it a point to understand exactly what it is that the bad guys are going to try to throw against black folks, black citizens trying to live their lives and who make sure that black people are ready. Proactive self-defense is the only kind of self-defense that matters.